Let me say a word or two about today's guest, who is a TVP two years ago. I consider him the, the most important documentary filmmaker in Japan right now. Not only that, but a voice for the film scene in Japan and also all sorts of social issues in Japan as well. I first encountered him in, I think it was Nyon, if I'm not wrong, at a film festival. And we ended up uh, at the festival bar and on a picnic table drinking wine. And I immediately recognized uh, someone special. I thought, this guys he's going to be big. And uh, I was right. <laughs> um, he started his education at Todai. He was at Tokyo University. And he was um, the editor of the paper there, a very, very prestigious position. And also the student paper, I mean. And he was studying religion. And it strikes me that he, uh, this major strikes me in two ways. It says two things about Soda. First of all, um, he's a searcher. He's always thinking about humanity in its most profound ways. And he's um, uh, always curious about things. If you talk to him, He's somewhere inside you immediately. You, you feel it, and it's a warm feeling. It's not an invasive one. <laughs> but um, he has this analytical side, and he's interested in the biggest questions about life. And I think that makes for the best filmmaking, too. Um, the other aspect of him is uh, that he was the editor of the student newspaper at T Tokyo University. Like I said, it's a very prestigious position. It's kind of in like the newspaper at Harvard is as well. People who are in these editorships often go on to quite glorious careers, usually in journalism, of course. But he took a left turn or a right turn or some kind of turn <laughs> uh, because he completely burned out. It was, um, it, it sounds like a horror show to me. Um, and he decided to turn away from that. In some ways, in some ways not, because he's still very much a writer. But he, um, um, while he was at Todai and doing all these things, um, he did a thesis on cults, cult religions. And he wanted to do Om Shinrikyo. <laughs> but his professor said, no, 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 you better not go there. <laughs> uh, very correctly, as it turns out. Um, but he infiltrated, actually, another cult and spent time there in a sort of eth ethnographic participata participatory observation and wrote about this. And uh, like I said, he's thinking about the big issues. And he <laughs> started, I think, really questioning what he was doing uh, with his education and in those subjects. And he decided to go into film. And so after graduation, he went to New York. And he studied at the New York School of Visual Arts. Um, and he learned fiction filmmaking, documentary, but I think he was mainly interested in fiction filmmaking. But after he graduated, he started working for NHK. So he was doing lots of N NHK documentaries, lots of them. And NHK follows a certain kind of format. I don't know if I'm stealing your thunder if you're going to talk about <laughs> this, but uh, you know, turn on NHK, it always looks the same, right? That's because all the filmmakers are essentially forced to work in the same framework with the same conventions. You can't depart from it. In fact, their documentaries are scripted, and the scripts have to be cleared, and then they shoot them. And he got really tired of this. As you can imagine, it would be tiring. And he, he's a creative person. And so he stopped that. Around the same time, he also discovered direct cinema style, which I'm sure he'll be talking about. And it's a certain genre of documentary. And he plunged into that whole hog. And that's what he's been doing ever since. Um, he's made eight films in this style. They're numbered. And they start with Campaign, which is a really charming and curious film about a minor election. But you learn all about electoral politics in Japan. 
And then he goes on to do other films, things about, for instance, a very, very special mental hospital and uh, the methods going on inside that. Uh, a film about cats, which is really about peace, which is the title. Um, l the films are always charming. They're all, all always v um, built the very sophisticated structures, which will go right past you if you're not looking carefully. But they're really crafted, wonderful works of documentary art. And people are noticing this. Not People from the very beginning recognize something special with these films in Japan. But from his first film, it, it showed all over the international film circuit and every film since as well. And now um, he's starting even to get retrospectives of his work, including um, at places like Pop Popoli and Montreal coming up. There was a whole retrospective of his, of his work in China. And it's shown in Japan all the time. Also, Mubi right now is showing a lot of these films. So if you are a subscriber to Mubi, um, you can catch films um, from him there as well. The library has also a bunch of the videos. Let's see. Um, and his most recent films have been in distribution in Japan. One is Inland Sea, which is a deceivingly complicated, hey, defe deceivingly simple film, The op which <laughs> One or the other, or both. <laughs> I mean, it, it just looks like a bunch of old people next to the seashore, um, you know, going fishing and talking about food, and they're kind of crazy and old and dying. But it's very much uh, this amazing cycle from catching a sea harvest and circulating it through a little town, dying town, and then secrets that are revealed at the very end. It's an amazing film. It's, it um, premiered at Berlin, and it's been showing all over the world right now. And the other film, which also showed in Berlin in the Film Critics Week, is The Big House, which he'll be talking about today. These films were both in distribution all over Japan, um, actually still are, all since the spring. Is Inland Sea still showing? Yeah. Oh my god. So, I mean, they're just going through every city in Japan right now. It's, it's extraordinary. Not many filmmakers in documentary especially can do this, or independent <coughs> cinema in general. Um, but I want to recall that he is an also a writer, and coming out of that editorial experience, it turns out that this is a second side of him which I think is really precious and wonderful. After 311, he noticed that people weren't really writing seriously or critically about what was going on in the world. And so he started doing it through Twitter and other social media. And immediately, all these people started following him. And over the years, he's become a really important public intellectual in Japan. Um, he's, he's been on the cover of Aira. You know, he, you see interviews with him about all sorts of subjects all the time. He's currently in a big legal battle with the Japanese government over uh, s separate names for men and women, especially foreigners. And um, so, I mean, I've had regularly had the experience of flicking on the TV and <laughs> there's soda, you know? <laughs> so far, I mean, it reminds me, actually, uh, of a filmmaker that has a social voice. It reminds me of Oshima Nagisa, who did the same kinds of things. You know, he was also appearing on long talk shows. He, he spoke his mind. He said things that other people would not say. But so far, I don't think uh, Soda's been appearing with uh, white suits and boas <laughs> or kimono. <laughs> and he doesn't yell at people like Oshima always did, because uh, he's a nice guy. Um, and he's also, but he's in high demand. Um, he writes books about pretty much every film he makes and books about other things, about social issues. Um, you know, he wrote a book about this one, which I'm, I think we'll hear about. And uh, he's a worker bee. I mean, with all that, those people demanding his time, uh, I was just kind of bowled over this spring and summer because when Inland Sea w went into distribution, he did about, he did over 50 interviews. 
with all sorts of places, t TV, magazines, you name it. Um, and then when the big house showed right after that, he did a no more, 50 more plus interviews. And uh, I was kind of bummed because I was there too and I always wanted to be interviewed <laughs> <laughs> about a film I made. No one wanted to talk to me. But, That's um, not true. Oh, <laughs> uh, really? <laughs> but it, it's not exactly true. But um, we had so, a really good time in talking about the film. We did some public fora where we um, did dialogues about the film. It was really a kick in the pants. And tomorrow, the film is being shown at MLB4 at 4 o'clock. There's going to be a panel uh, which features Soda and a couple scholars, including a guy from Classics who's going to talk about the big house from the perspective of the history of Stadia from presumably the Greeks and Romans to the present. And then uh, we'll show the film and then have a big Q&A session with including some of the students as well. So without further ado, let me bring up Soda. Give him a warm <laughs> greeting. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus. Do you hear me or is it working? Yeah. Okay. Oh, good, good. It doesn't sound like uh, it's working, but uh, it does, okay. Um, uh, well, uh, thank you for all the compliments. Uh, it's very exaggerated, but uh, <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you for coming to, to listen to this lecture. Um, and I'm so happy to be back in Ann Arbor. I spent uh, seven, I don't know, eight months here from uh, 2016 through uh, 2017 and um, we got to make a feature-length film The Big House um, and that was one of the uh, most exciting experiences in my life and uh, and also rewarding and uh, really uh, enjoyable experience and uh, thanks to Marcus and also Terry Saris she's, she's here oh yeah <laughs> we co-teach the class and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I'm, I, I'm, that's I'm going to talk about uh, today. And uh, I, I'm, I created this title, The Big House Project, How and Why We Made a Documentary in Observational Method and Style. And uh, I don't know how many of you have seen The Big House. Uh, okay, it was played in the Ann Arbor Film Festival, so you guys may, must have seen it over there. But uh, most, of, most of them haven't seen it yet, so um, I'd like to show the trailer of the film so that you, you have a basic idea about the film. against God. I want you to find freedom. I want you to find peace with God.
So yeah, this is the film uh, we made, and uh, we, uh, in total of uh, 17 filmmakers, uh, including 13 students, uh, made this film together. And I, um, in this lecture, I'd like to talk about first um, about my own uh, method and style. Um, I call my films observational films, and uh, how we apply the method and style to make this particular film. Um, that's how, how this lecture is structured. So let me give you my brief bio. Um, I was born and raised in Japan. And I, uh, just, uh, just as uh, Marcus mentioned, I studied religion at Tokyo University. And in 1993, I moved to New York. And uh, I studied at the, uh, I, I studied mostly fiction films uh, at the School of Visual Arts. And uh, I had no interest in documentary back then, so <laughs> I didn't even take a documentary class. <laughs> I thought I was going to be a fiction filmmaker, but uh, accident, accidents happen all the time, right? Um, I, joined, I, I accidentally joined a company which produced documentaries. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So 1993 until 19, uh, 2004, I worked as a TV director, uh, making a lot of, lot of TV shows for Japanese public network, uh, NHK. Um, and, uh, but then um, I got frustrated with the method and style. I was forced to make uh, TV documentaries, and I started making my own observational films in 2005. And, uh, I made uh, nine films altogether now. Uh, the first one is called Campaign, which uh, observed the behind the scenes of uh, 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 election process of uh, LDP candidate, Liberal Democratic Party, uh, which is not very liberal or democratic, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, I did that. And the uh, second one is called Mental. It's about the people with mental illness. Uh, I made Peace and Theater 1 and Theater 2. Uh, altogether, it's like 5 hours and 42 minutes. Uh, it's, a, it's a really long film, Theater 1 and 2. And then I made Campaign 2 and Oyster Factory and Inland Sea and The Big House is the latest one. Uh, it's an observational uh, film series number 8, but uh, if you include Peace, which is extra, uh, I made uh, nine films altogether in the same method and style. And uh, why do I call my films observational films? Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to call, call my films observational films is I wanted to redefine observation. Um, in my mind, um, to me, observation is a key to make good documentaries. And uh, when I say observation, it means, it doesn't mean you are distant. It doesn't mean you are or a third party. It doesn't mean that way. Uh, what I mean is uh, look and listen. Look and listen. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, there are two levels of looking and listening. Um, one is that I, as a filmmaker, try to look and listen, be, be open to the world uh, in front of you, and try to learn something from it, and make a film according to what you discovered, uh, or what you, what you saw and what you heard. That's one level. And another level is that I want the audience to look and listen carefully, right? So there are two levels of observation uh, involved in this uh, cinematic uh, style and uh, method. And uh, how do I make such film? How do I make you know, a film where a filmmaker is open to the world and also the audience is also open to the film and uh, look and lis listen attentively? You know? Then I came up with this. Ten Commandments of Observational Filmmaking. Um, remember, I studied religion, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a joke, but uh, it's not really a joke. <laughs> uh, 
So I came up with 10 commandments. And um, number one is no research. Um, it's actually quite uh, unusual. Um, if you talk to any documentary filmmaker, probably 90, 99% of them would say the most important in documentary filmmaking is to research. But uh, I decided no research um, because I'm lazy. <laughs> not really. <laughs> no, um, it's not because I, I'm lazy, but uh, I. I thought um, if you do a lot of research beforehand and uh, you're stuck with your own idea or you're st stuck with your own knowledge and try to shoot whatever you already know. Um, maybe it's only me, but uh, I myself um, found that way. Uh, oh, by the way, this filmmaking method is only, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's not a method that, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't believe everybody should do that. It's, it's something that works for me. So I'm not saying this is the only way of, you know, documentary filmmaking, but uh, it works for me. So, um, so no research works for me, uh, rather than doing a lot of research. And uh, number two, no meetings with subjects. Um, of course, we, we have to have some sort of agreement uh, to, to make a documentary, but we don't discuss what kind of scenes we're making, or what kind of themes of the film it's going to be, because we don't know. We don't know the theme of the film. Um, we don't set up any, I don't set up any theme of the film before, we sh before I shoot, uh, because I don't want to be stuck with a preconception, with a, with a preconceived idea about what, you know, what kind of film it's going to be. So in the case of Big House, we, we know we are going to shoot the Big House, but we don't know what it's, this film is going to be about. That's something we will find out by making the film, by shooting the film, and also editing the film. So um, we don't we try to just jump into the situation and roll the camera and see what happens. That's, that's the method we, we do. And uh, number three, obviously no scripts. Um, this is something that um, I was forced to do when I was making TV documentaries. Uh, contrary to many people's belief, uh, we do have scripts. Uh, for TV documentaries. Um, I, I'm usually, I, when I was a TV director, I was always forced to do a lot of research, a lot of meetings with subjects, and uh, write a detailed script, which shows uh, beginning, middle, and end. And uh, also, I even, wrote a narration before I wrote the camera. <laughs> and also, I also like uh, say in this section, uh, this person will say something like that. Like, you know, you kind of uh, come up with uh, some sort of a hypothetical interview so that you can see the flow of the film. And, uh, and you even have a, you know, conclusion in the ending, right? And uh, after this script is, is uh, confirmed or approved by the producer, you go out and shoot. So if you do that, what happens is that uh, you try to follow the script. But the thing is, um, my experience has been that, uh, you know, it's, the reality is much more rich and complicated, and uh, always accidents happen, and also always unexpe unexpected things happen. And they are much more interesting than what you wrote in your head. So I sometimes shot the accidents and I change the try to change the course of the film. But then when I go back to the editing room, Producers complain, why you didn't follow the script? I didn't give you a green sign to this project. 
But isn't it kind of strange <laughs> if that happens? You are, you, you are a documentary filmmaker. You are, try, you are supposed to be learning from what's going on. But uh, you tend to be more stuck with your own idea and just follow what you already decided. And uh, rather, I'd like to have a fresh look at, at the world and, uh, and the world we live in and make a film according to our new discoveries. So that's uh, number three, no scripts. And uh, number four, roll the camera yourself. Um, this is a this is a commandment. Um, I came up because you know uh, because I don't make any plans. Then if I have a camera person, separate camera person, you know I need to. It's it's hard to schedule <laughs> <laughs> with everybody. Like if I have another sound person, you know I need to negotiate you know everything like. Uh, but. If I'm alone and shooting, uh, maybe possibly with my wife, uh, she's a producer, and uh, maybe, yeah, two people in the same family, maybe I can do you know, <laughs> spontaneous shoots. But uh, with a uh, you know, professional camera person or sound person or a driver or assistant, it's hard. So I decided, OK, roll the camera yourself. And uh, uh, that's number four. So I shoot like this. This is when I was shooting mental. Uh, I roll the camera. I also record the sound. Uh, uh, that's a big microphone on top of the camera. Like this. So I often you know, try to look at the monitor and also look at the person in front of me at the same time. And uh, number five, shoot for as long as possible. Um, rather than just have a quick shoot of whatever you have in your mind, you just stay there. Let's say two, pe two people are talking about whatever daily conversation, like over a cup of coffee for one hour, you roll the camera for one hour. Because you never know what's going to happen, right? I mean, you, you may have a really like a, uh, uh, exciting discovery by rolling the camera. Because we don't plan ahead. We never know what's going to happen. So we roll the camera um, as much as possible. And uh, number six. Cover small areas deeply, um, rather than shooting bits and pieces of everything. Um, just like, just to be able to feel that we covered everything. Um, so in the case of the, the big house, we you know big house is a big so <laughs> already big, <laughs> but we try to stay inside the big house or around the big house, right? It's a uh, we, we, we need some sort of focal point because to make good observation, uh, you need to focus. And you cannot observe this and this and this and this and this and this and so many things at the same time. It's impossible. So it's, it's important to limit the scope of your camera to small areas uh, rather than the vast, like, you can't make a film about this world, like, you know, the entire world. I mean, maybe you could, but uh, it's almost impossible, right? But rather, you want to limit. That's number six. And uh, number seven, do not set up a theme or goal before editing. Um, the same thing. Um, if you have a theme or if you want, like, a message before you even edit, then you just pick and choose whatever that fits to the theme, and uh, you can make discoveries. Let's say, okay, if you if you want, if you have a, 
if you have a goal like, uh, okay, I, I want to portray the big house as uh, heaven, and then you only pick whatever positive things, right, about the stadium, and you neglect or, or cut uh, down everything that's, that might be negative about the image of the big house. So in order to be open to many different possibilities and uh, discoveries, you don't want to think about the theme before, before, the, before the edit. Theme is something you discover by making edits. And number eight, um, no narration, superimposed titles or music. This is because I want the audience to look and listen as well. And uh, I, um, I, often, uh, I often find that the narration or, or titles or music interfere with uh, audiences' observations. So we, we don't want to use it. Um, of course, you know, uh, you could have a brilliant narration which enhances the viewing experience. You could, but uh, I decided just forget about it and try to tell the story visually. Um, and uh, number nine, use long takes. Um, this is, a, this is a hard to de define what is long take, but uh, it's, a, it's a spirit. Uh, rather than showing it in uh, chopped off, like uh, shots, I want, I want to show the audience like, a, like enough time. Like I want, because if you, if you chop the cuts in pieces, the audience have no time to to no room to observe. And number 10, this is a tough one. Um, pay for the production yourself. Um, <laughs> obviously, the big house, with the big house, we couldn't do it. I mean, it's a class project. It's uh, uh, funded by, fully funded by the university. So this commandment I couldn't uh, keep uh, for the big house, but uh, um, I usually uh, uh, observe this uh, commandment too, uh, because I want to be independent and uh, I don't want any inference from people who put up the money for. Um, you know, it's a very capitalistic world, so if you, if you pay for something he or she has the final say, right, usually. <laughs> so um, I want to be the person who, who has the final say about my own project. So, and, uh, and luckily, uh, with the Big House project, um, we didn't have any um, issue with the uh, management of the uh, university. Um, I'm lucky to be to be working with a very liberal, uh, free-spirited uh, university, and uh, which usually do, do not happen. But so I was, I was actually concerned about the freedom we would have from the administration of this university. But uh, uh, when I talked with Marcus, uh, he kind of assured uh, me that uh, we have freedom, creative freedom, over the over the production. So. Uh, Although it was paid by the university, uh, we had a lot of freedom, complete freedom. Okay, and uh, all of these things um, I didn't create from scratch. Um, its inspiration is from Dirac Cinema, uh, which is uh, American, uh, mainly American movement of documentary filmmaking. Uh, pioneered by uh, people like Frederick Wiseman, D.A. Pennebaker, Mesa's brothers um, from 1960s. Um, and uh, I, try, I tried to arrange uh, their method and style in my own way. And um, 
And that's the 10 commandments I came up with. Yeah. Any questions so far? Yeah. Um, what about distribution and where your um, films are shown, and also how do you um, make a living? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, I've been lucky to to produce everything on my own and uh, sell the film to distributors. Uh, to TV stations or to, to online distributors and um, get the money from a box office or whatever and uh, use the money to live and also to make another film. So it's like my apartment is like a small studio. Uh, um, I, work, uh, I work in my apartment. So, uh, and uh, remember my company is uh, only me and my wife, so um, we are kind of like, a, how do you say, kanaise <laughs> shikogyo. I don't know the English. Okay. <laughs> um, whatever, yeah, it's, it's, it's a home, like a, like a, yeah. And, but, you know, it's, it's been, uh, since 2005, you know, 2005, yeah, yeah, uh, we've been surviving like that. So, um, yeah, so we, we've been very self-sufficient, actually. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Okay. Any? So, um, I have a question over yeah. here. So, um, in light of one of your commandments, yeah. which was, there shall be no narration or intertitles, Right. I found the trailer, I guess it's a German trailer, right. really uh, jarring, yes. uh, kind of disturbing right. in a way with those intertitles. Uh -huh. And um, so the, the um, sort of explicit, right. yes. um, you know, the explicit interpretation that this is a slice of America, right. not just a slice, that this is America. Right. You know, when I saw your film, I mean, uh, it struck me almost as ethnographic of a particular ritual, right. a very specific and particular ritual. And um, I just wondered, well, what did you think of that, uh, that contradiction? But right. also, um, do you think that most film-going audiences that are not American, especially Japanese right. viewers, right. do you think that they see this as America? Ah, uh, you mean the big house? Yeah. Okay. I well, mean, yeah. as, as not as American, but right. as America, <laughs> right? Okay, okay. Well, um, the first question, it's easy. Um, uh, the uh, trailer is not an observational film. It's a uh, commercial. It's a propaganda, right? Yeah. So I make it as a propaganda. Yeah. Actually, I I I I made a the uh, trader myself. So and I'm good at I'm actually good at propaganda. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I try to do something totally different, opposite uh, when I make the actual film. And. Uh, um, the, uh, did the Japanese audience saw it as the, um, as America? That was your question. Uh, I'm not sure. Like, that, well, right, right, right. I, I don't think, I don't think so. I mean, um, people who watches this film, this kind of film, takes a lot of different way, di different things. Uh, even though we publicized it as some sort of a, this is American way of living or this is American society, but when you look at the film, the film is much more complicated, and uh, they take away whatever they, you know, found interesting. So I think uh, the reaction to the film varies. Like uh, it's very diverse. So I don't think uh, there is singular interpretation to, to the film. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, 
maybe I could uh, uh, move on to the next stage and I'll, I'll take more questions. Okay. And uh, okay, so how do we apply the way I may make films, like uh, ob this observational method and style for, big, for the big house? Um, <laughs> um, this is when I, sh uh, this is a picture I shot when I arrived in Ann Arbor in 2016 um, with Marcus Nones and uh, Terry Saris. Uh, we co-taught the class of 13 students, um, undergrad, and um, we, we made a film together. Uh, These are, these are the, this is a whole crew of people, uh, except for uh, Prasad, uh, who is over there. Uh, he also joined the shoot. Um, he's, he teaches uh, screenwriting uh, at the UM, but uh, he helped us out uh, when we were shooting. So 13 students plus three professors plus Prasad, so it was 17, 17 people working together. And uh, this is the syllabus, uh, the, the uh, beginning of the syllabus uh, we have. Uh, it's SAC 401, the Big House Project for 2016, history, theory, and practice of observational documentary. Uh, I didn't write this, it's uh, Marcus and uh, Terry uh, came up with this, and and uh, it was really uh, and we met every Tuesday and Thursdays, uh, and uh, in total seven hours of classes in a week. And uh, how we broke down was that the one you know we we had like a three I think three themes in this class. One is obviously we tried to make a feature length documentary about the big house together, collaboratively, right? Collabor collaboratively, yeah. <laughs> That's one, one thing we, we try to do. And another uh, aspect is that the theory of documentary, uh, it's about direct cinema style documentary and uh, uh, mainly uh, Marcus uh, had a lecture about theory and also, also ethics of documentaries. And we also showed uh, many uh, classic classics of direct cinema style documentaries. Like, uh, I forgot the titles, but. Uh, <laughs> High, School. High School by Frederick Wiseman, or War Room, War Room by uh, D.A. Tennant Baker and Chris Hedges. And, uh, Give Me Shelter by Mesos Brothers. Yeah, we, we showed all these classics. Uh, and also Leviathan. Um, it's a new kind of direct cinema style documentary. So we not only try to make a film ab about the big house, but also we try to educate uh, the students with, uh, with history and the theory and ethics. And, and that's, that was the, how the, how the class was uh, structured. And uh, in terms of the production, um, we decided to have um, some sort of a location scouting, although I'm usually not allowed to make any <laughs> uh, uh, research. But uh, this is a class, and uh, we had a lot of students. And uh, without any like hint or any some sort of preliminary brainstorming, it might not work. So we decided, okay, why don't we take a tour of, of the big house? And uh, we, one day we went to the big house on a, big day, uh, on a game day so that we could experience the same as on the, on the shooting day. This, uh, also location from location scouting, these are students, and that's uh, Kurt uh, uh, hmm? Svodba. Svodba. Uh, he's the uh, head of 
uh, head of the uh, communication department of the athletic, athletic, athletic department. And he was the one who gave us uh, all kinds of permission to shoot and roam around the stadium um, on the field and also behind the scenes. And uh, she, Sarika, he, she, she was too anxious to just to look and so she started shooting. <laughs> <laughs> which I welcome because, you know, she has no preconception, but she already, you know, started roaring the camera. So, and uh, after we had this, you know, scouting, we, we, we met in the class and, uh, uh, you know, everybody came up with their own interest. Like, you know, somebody wanted to make uh, focus on, okay, we, we, we try to divide the tasks, uh, which area we focus on, right? So, and uh, some students wanted to focus on marching band, or some students wanted to focus on, on the kitchen, which feeds, you know, 100,000 people. Some people wanted to focus on, 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 on security. Some people wanted to focus on, on, on the MDEN, um, all kinds of different aspects, right? So we, we try to kind of uh, uh, have some sort of, uh, uh, we, we try to divide the tasks. And, uh, and uh, we decided to shoot four, four games, I guess, four or five. Four? Yeah, four or five games. And uh, every time we, we shot, like they said, yeah, obvious, obviously we, we shot it in, in, in the field and also we shot in the marching band. Somebody shot in the press room and somebody focused on the press people in the field. This is a meeting room uh, before the game um, on the on the game day, uh, somebody shot in the kitchen. This uh, point of view of uh, this being watched. <laughs> <laughs> A student, Sean, she, he he wanted to throw in the uh, the uh, GoPro camera, which is uh, uh, waterproof. <laughs> Into the, into the dishwasher and uh, one of the most avant-garde shots <laughs> in the film. Yeah, people are very creative uh, when shooting. Um, and I didn't oversee anybody, like uh, I was also shooting. So everybody was you know, shooting on their own and came up with their angles, like while shooting. They didn't preconceive the uh, stories. They just went to the scene, uh, they are interested and uh, started rolling the camera and uh, shot whatever they were, you know, they were interested. And that's something we stressed to the students. Like, don't, don't think about the goal. Don't think about what kind of story you, you're making beforehand. You try to discover you know, what's going on while shooting. And this is a medical team. Uh, this is a VIP room. Um, uh, in the uh, other stadium. And then this is a president's uh, tailgate party where a lot of people are cutting checks. <laughs> and uh, this is a discovery that uh, Jacob made, uh, one of the students. He, he wanted to, he wanted to uh, shoot the way um, the big house was cleaned after the game on Sunday. And uh, what he discovered was the, the volunteer who clean uh, belongs to the church. And they have a service within the big house after the cleaning. So he shot that. And uh, some preachers on the street um, you know this guy. John U. Bacon, <laughs> one of the students wanted to follow him around. Oh. You know this guy. 
Um, oh, by the way, um, uh, Coach Harbor was one of, one of the rare things we were not able to shoot. Uh, we were able to shoot only at the press conference or when he was being interviewed by other, other press people. So um, we couldn't you know, really do the behind the scenes of, of the coach himself. And also, we were not allowed in the locker room during the, in, on the game day. So um, these are the two off limits we had. But we decided you know, uh, early on that maybe this film is not about the game. It's actually everything but the game. So it didn't really matter to us. Or rather, because of that limitation, we, I think we, we agreed well, to, to make a film about everything but the game, uh, which is an uh, interesting angle because um, usually what you see on TV is a game, right? Everybody is all concerned about the game only. And uh, it's something you always get to see. And uh, even, you know, if, if, we fo we, if we try to focus on the game, uh, we have a big disadvantage, you know, we, you know, films takes uh, at least a year to complete. And uh, by the time the film is out, you know, the game is not so relevant or, you know, people lose interest in what happened in the game, right? So rather, we wanted to focus on what doesn't change over time, which is how they prepare, how, how do they work to to accommodate 100,000 people, which is the same size as the city <laughs> itself. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's a ridiculous task. How do they do that? And so that's how we, we thought and planned. So every time we, we shot, uh, af after we shot the game, uh, we met in the class, and uh, everybody showed the footage they shot. And we had discussion, critiques, and then uh, also we also discussed like uh, the content, like uh, or, or make discoveries like, oh wow. Um, uh, uh, and that kind of angles. A um, lot of people see the difference in race or class or yeah, many people, you know, many students point to the fact that, you know, um, uh, different aspects of American society. And uh, we, uh, we shot, you know, another game, another game, like, you know, this kind of, you know, cycle, you know. Every time we shot the game, we come back and we, we show the sh footage to the, to the class and discuss and then come back to shooting. So we repeat it for, for three or four times. And we gathered all the necessary uh, uh, elements to make the film. And in the end, we probably had 70 to 100 scenes, I guess. And uh, everybody who shot the film, uh, sh who, who shot the footage, edited their own segments. And uh, by the end of the uh, semester, uh, we put them together in one big sequence. And uh, I became the editor of the, the whole film. And um, and we came up with a rough, very long rough cut by the end of the semester, uh, which was about three hours and uh, 15, 15 minutes. But you know, three hours and 15 minutes is too long. Uh, so we need to cut it down and also improve all the shots. So over the next semester, uh, winter semester, uh, I and the three other students, uh, you know, took took on the editing job. Uh, we set up a temporary editing suite in Marcus's office, <laughs> and uh, we. we um, in four months, we came up with a fine cut of the film. And that's what the, uh, how we complete the film. Uh, by the way, you see some post-its over here. This, these are all the scenes um, like this. Uh, 
we shuffle around the scenes uh, so that it makes sense or it, you know, uh, this is a very uh, uh, important tool to make discoveries by editing. Um, okay. And the film was complete. And uh, this is, uh, uh, and uh, it, was, it was sold to uh, one of the Japanese distributors, uh, Tofu. They are, very uh, they are very active documentary distributors, uh, distributor in Japan. And uh, they ca came up with this poster. Uh, this is an English version. This is an international version of the poster, but they wanted to make a uh, Japanese version of the poster. And uh, it opened in, uh, in a theater in Tokyo called the Image Forum. Um, it's, on, it's a very small independent uh, art house cinema uh, uh, which houses about 100 people. But uh, it was packed uh, when we opened. And uh, me and Marcus and also Terry uh, had a Q&A after the, after the film. This is a selfie I took. <laughs> I, uh, it's my habit to take a, it's my hobby to take a <laughs> selfie with the audience. Actually, I need to take a selfie with you too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is outside the theater, you know, peop a lot of people show up. And uh, it lasts for eight weeks uh, in this theater, uh, the running of the, of the film. And also, uh, it was also uh, shown in about 25 different cities across the nation. Um, we made a brochure of the film, and uh, actually it's a catalog of the film, and uh, we were doing an autogra autograph. <laughs> this guy obviously is from the UM. UM it's an <laughs> alumni. <laughs> He was funny. He was, uh, I was watching with the audience and uh, every time, you know, we had a fight song, he was like. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is from Osaka. We, we did a, also a talk show after the screening. And um, I also wrote a book about the whole experience. It's called The Big House Shooting America. Um, <laughs> It's in, it's in Japanese. <laughs> so if you read Japanese, uh, I will leave it one copy to CJS. So uh, if you're interested, please check it out. And uh, we also did a you know, talk show about the public, you know, about the book. Um, Uh, as Marcus mentioned, uh, we did about uh, 50 interviews with the journalists alone um, in, in Japan alone. In, in Japan alone, and so all these uh, publicities were being put up in the theater, and uh, yeah, this is all publicity. And uh, this is uh, when I talked about the big house on the TV show. <laughs> And the uh, film will be shown tomorrow, and also will be also shown at the Michigan Theater from October 5th until 11th. And uh, many students, filmmakers will be, at, will, will be there to talk about the film Q&A. So if you are interested, please, please check it out. OK. Any questions? Yeah. So I was going to ask you before about editing. You said a certain amount about that. And so I'm curious about uh, the final process. And it's very mediated, right? And right. so in the film itself, how did you deal with that? So um, for instance, I'm thinking about like manufactured landscape where the camera turns back on the camera and things like that. And then are you looking for, again, I've not seen your films. Are you looking for a certain kind of rhythm within the film? that builds in any particular way, so that any uh, viewer would know this is the climax, this is the beginning. 
this is a turn or anything like that. So right. anything you can say on those lines, I'd be very uh, interested. Okay. Yeah. Um, definitely, you know, the film has to work as a film, right? And uh, we, my goal is that uh, the audience would feel as if they were there. So I would like the audience to feel that way. So I try to reconstruct the film according to that principle or goal. And, um, and while doing this process thing, you know, we, we find a lot of themes like, uh, oh, wow, I didn't realize you know, this scene and this scene, put, put them together, oh, wow, they're related. Or some scenes could be more interesting if they are far, far away. I mean, you know, I put them together side by side, but oh, actually this works better that way. So you discover a lot of things by doing the post-its and also revisions. And also every time we have a new cut, you know, we gathered and, um, and discussed, you know, what, you know, what's clear, what's missing, what's, you know, uh, what's good. So, yeah, so you know, countless trial, trial and errors, yeah. But it has to work as a film. Um, in, in a way, you've sort of democratized your method. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if you had uh, found that new way of working uh, uh, inspirational for future projects. Uh, did you say demo democratized? Yeah, so you've uh, opened yeah. up your method. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was actually a very democratic process. Uh, we decided, well, well, this has to be a very democratic film. Um, the, and uh, and uh, we, we decided to give every student uh, director's credit so that they could own the film. Um, they could claim the ownership. So every time we have some sort of a controversy or, or uh, every time we have some sort of issues, we discussed. And that's part of the education, you know, by discussing, you know, they learn so much about like, like ethics. Like, for example, there was one scene when um, somebody shot a guy being taken out of the stu stadium by the police. We don't know why he was taken out, but and uh, his face was, you know, really obvious and uh, recognizable. Are we, I mean, is it ethically okay to show him, you know, being ejected by the police? And uh, everybody has different opinions. So we, we discuss and discuss and discuss and uh, we reach a conclusion, right? So that was the process of the making. And actually we had one thing we couldn't agree um, it was about this ending, alternative ending. Actually, it was, uh, in the end, it was cut. But I insisted this has to be the ending. And that was, um, I have a few picture. I have some pictures. Yeah, it was right after the pr uh, election of 2016. There was a small protest um, beside the stadium. And uh, seven ones, eight people were, you know, protesting about the election of, the, of uh, Donald Trump. And uh, some Trump supporters showed up and uh, kind of started harassing them. <laughs> and I was shooting and I, I shot um, the whole thing. And I decided, you know, I, I insisted it, this has to be the ending of the film. But uh, it was split like the, the, there was a lot of objections, especially from Marcus too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, we, in the end, we couldn't reach an agreement. So we decided to vote. And uh, I totally lost. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we decided to cut the scene out. And, uh, yeah. But we are showing it on the 6th. Right. Uh, we are showing this alternative version as well to, to steer the discussion. Yeah. On the, on the, it's showing from the 5th to the 11th at the Michigan Theater. But on the 6th, homecoming Saturday after the game, we're showing the alternative version with a panel of the filmmakers. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. I 
think you partially answered my question about themes. And I'm wondering maybe if um, message mm. is a more appropriate word besides theme. I didn't really get a theme out of it when I watched the show, the documentary, but what I did get out of it was that it takes a village to put this on. Most people just see three hours of, of uh, players on the field and don't realize all the, all the work that goes in before that. So I wondered if you actually would like people to get, the audience to get their own message, each, each person, each time they see it perhaps. And then that got me thinking about the Bible and your Ten Commandments and how in, with the Bible, everybody gets their own message out of that too. And I wondered how much of that really, your influence went through that way, sub consciously or not? Well, um, you know, I, I try to avoid the word message. Uh, maybe you notice already, but uh, message is something you can say in the world, right? Like uh, in words. But, uh, you know, I believe film is a, a nonverbal uh, communication form of com communication, and uh, you could uh, convey a um, uh, lot of things other than things that you can convey by words. And that's the beauty of the filmmaking. And also, that's the weakness of filmmaking, because you know, people take many different can take a lot of in different interpretations from you know, uh, the same shot I'm sh I'm we are showing. So, but, uh, yeah, we, we, I try to, uh, uh, person, I, personally, I try to depict the world um, as, as I see it. It's a personal point of view. Yeah, I, I, I try to use the word try point of view rather than, rather than message, because point of view is more ambiguous. Point of view is more, more um, open to different interpretations. So, uh, the big house, you know, I, I try to, to construct the film that way as well. And um, Bible thing, uh, <laughs> I'm not Christian, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, and there are many religious elements in the in the film, and uh, that's that's that reflects my interest as well. Yeah, I think. Yeah. On that note, we're going to have to bring this oh. to a close. Okay.